and shoulder pain that is for low back pain, hip pain, knee pain, all that stuff, usually improves with movement, not with rest. And uh, our desk bound lives have been uh, pretty, pretty detrimental to, to our overall orthopedic health. So uh, it's 5.03. I am going to pop back here. We got to get going because today's is kind of long. Um, I'm going to get this uh, little picture off here. Here we go. So uh, I'm going to put the, the microphone down and we're going to get going. We're going to actually start off with stuff for the ankles because we know they're so closely uh, tied into what's going on with the hips and knees and back. So what you're going to be doing is actually having your feet hip width apart. Hip, shoulder, somewhere around there. Your feet are just going to stay flat on the ground. Let's see if I can move back. Maybe you guys can see me a little bit better. And you're gonna put your knees, or excuse me, hands directly on your knees. So it looks like this from the side, my back is straight. And what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be making knee circles. So I'm just kind of stirring the pot with my knees. And so I'm going through inversion, eversion, plantar flexion, dorsiflexion with my ankles, but I'm also going through flexion and extension of my knees. And I'm just gonna do eight in each direction. We're just waking up those ankles because we're about to do a variation of a plank that requires a lot of ankle, dorsi, and plantar flexion. It's really good to get tight calves to kind of loosen up so we can then squat, which we're gonna do some, some squatting today. We're gonna do some hip hinging. Two variations of planks. Maybe you've seen them. We're gonna dive right into the first one here and I'm going the other direction. I don't even know, I probably did like 400 in that direction. Three, and we're just kind of hula hooping with our knees waking up our ankles and our knees and our hips even five six we got two more seven and eight okay i'm going to tilt this camera down just so you guys can see me on that mat a little bit better Whoop. man down anything can happen in these lives right okay ah, there we go all right we're all still there there we go okay so I'm gonna be on my mat. There we go. Alright, here we go. <laughs> Alright, so we're gonna be doing a plank for our ankles that takes us through plantar and dorsiflexion. So we just did some circles, but we know that if we're lacking dorsiflexion or the ability to bring our toes up towards our head like this, our squats are gonna be altered, our running is gonna be altered, and all the mechanics up the chain are gonna be affected. And so we're gonna do a plank where you have your toes on the ground, you're gonna drop your heels, here we go, drop your heels down, and then push them forward. And you're gonna drop them down and push them forward. And we're going for 12. You wanna keep your butt down, and you wanna be on your elbows, to keep your hips more in line with your shoulders and your ankles. So you have your butt nice and tight, your abs are nice and tight, and you're not going up here, that's bad news. So we're squeezing tight, six, I'm halfway there. Seven, you just wanna roll directly over your toes, you're gonna get some of that big toe mobility that's super important for your running, super important to prevent front of the knee pain or anterior knee pain. And we go, I think three more. One, two, and three. All right, let's move this so you guys can see me a little better. So we're gonna be going, kind of jumping all over the place, but near the end, we're gonna go through a lot of the trunk stability and hip stability stuff kind of together. It's like, you know, you go out to eat and you know you get a great steak and maybe you get some vegetables you're going to eat the vegetables first because you want to save the steak the good stuff for last so we're going to be doing that today any of you who are vegetarians and vegans maybe it's whatever the main dish is that you're looking forward to the most you save it for last and that's what we're going to be doing so we got some single leg deadlifts some bridging some squatting all that stuff is later on but right now we're going to go into a little bit of lumbar and thoracic cats and camels so typically when we do a cat and camel, you push your whole spine up, you push your whole spine down. But with segmented cats and camels, we're gonna focus on just the low back and then just the upper back because we wanna show that we have good control 
but also can achieve a little bit more mobility by just focusing on one area. So we're gonna do six for the lumbar spine and six for the thoracic spine. So what I want you to do is just focus on moving your pelvis and that's gonna get you to move mostly your low back. And we're going for six. Take your time with them. Get that big toe mobility going. You might as well while you're down here. We're not directly focusing on it uh, with anything today, so sneak it in where you can. Tuck your pelvis and maybe you get a little shake and bake in your abs. We got two more. Two, two. All right, so now we're gonna focus on the upper back, the thoracic spine. And if you have sensitive wrists, maybe you wanna drop down here, go onto your forearms, that's good. If not, here you are, you got your wrists underneath your shoulders, you're gonna push your upper, upper back up, and then drop between your shoulder blades. So you're just pushing up and dropping between your shoulder blades, and we're focusing on getting some thoracic mobility. We know that the thoracic spine is crucial in the mobility of our overall spine. So a lot of movement has to occur in our thoracic spine so we can take some of the pressure off of our lumbar spine. So our low back doesn't compensate for a lack of movement in our thoracic spine or in our, our hip. We're gonna get to some of that stuff a little bit later. But we've done cats and camels for the lumbar spine and cats and camels for the thoracic spine. Now we're going to do a nice little stretch, okay, and it's going to be a child's pose. I've been sneaking this one in a lot lately because I do think it's very valuable for stretching out the muscles in your low back, but also your lats, which go from your shoulder all the way down to your pelvis. They, they, go, they connect the upper body and the lower body. They're the biggest muscles in our body by surface area, while our glutes are the biggest by mass. So they can have a lot of effects on what our low back and our shoulders and our hips are doing. So it is important to stretch these guys out. So we're going to sit back. We're going to slide our hands forward like a regular child's pose. But then we're going to bring our hands over to one side and then the other. And so you should feel the stretch on your elongated or your long side. And you're just stretching out your lats, and I want you to relax your head. We're gonna be here for about a minute. Check the clock so I don't uh, keep you here for three minutes like I used to do. And I want you to just breathe, and it should feel like a nice stretch on the side of your body. It shouldn't be painful. It shouldn't be something you wanna get out of. It should, should, should actually be something you wanna to continue to do. And you say, oh, Mike, it really stinks that we have to go to the other side. But. Stretching is something you want to do again. It's not something that you should dread. It's not something that should be very painful. Your body's just not gonna relax and you're not gonna be able to actually get that length uh, that we're going for with your muscles. So we've got about 20 seconds left here. Then we're gonna be going on to the other side. And then from here, we're gonna flip over onto our butt and we're going to start addressing our hip mobility. So we're going thoracic mobility and then hip mobility. And those are the areas of rotation in our body. And if we don't rotate well, we'll go to the other side. If we don't rotate well in those areas, we're going to try to find it somewhere else. That's kind of how the body, the body works. The, body, the brain comes up with an idea. says, hey, I want to move like this. And the body says, okay, I'll try my best. If you don't have the needed mobility, flexibility, or strength, the body starts to compensate. And if we're lacking rotation in our hips and in our thoracic spine, the body says, okay, I'm gonna to try to get it in your knees or your low back. Neither of those areas of our body rotate very well. But we're gonna try. And so when those structures are stressed like that, that's when they start to hurt. And they say, hey, I don't like this. I wanna change it, or I wanna stop. And that's what generates a pain signal. I'm feeling a big stretch coming down the left side of my body. Just breathing nicely. We got about five seconds left here before we just pop down onto our butts. Okay, and so we're gonna do some very, very, very easy 90-90 hip switches. And so it's a 90-90 hip switch because we keep our hips at about 90 degrees from our torso and our knees are bent to 90 degrees. And the easiest version of this is sitting back with your hands down 
on the floor. Your feet are roughly about shoulder width. And then you're gonna drop your knees down to the floor. And now you can see kind of 90 degrees, 90 degrees between my thighs, 90 degree at my other knee. So we're going internal rotation on one hip, external rotation on the other, kind of like a golf swing. And then we're switching sides. And what you're gonna find is that your butt is gonna kind of scoop forward. Just adjust your arms as that happens, not a big deal. And we're gonna go for eight to each side. It's been researched a lot. If you are lacking internal and external rotation of your hips, regardless of if you're an athlete, like a golfer, if you're just, you know, regular Joe Schmo off the street and you're lacking internal and external rotation in your hips, you're probably more susceptible to having low back pain, especially internal rotation, especially this internal rotation of the hip. That has been uh, shown to have a strong correlation with low back pain. I think I got three more. As you can see, I'm kind of scooting towards you guys. I got one more. And then we are continuing with the hips for hip rotation. All right. Scat time. Because we're going to go into a pigeon. Now, pigeon pose is going to be great at opening up or stretching your glutes, your posterior capsule, the back of your hip, basically. And it's going to allow you to get a little bit deeper in your squat without having this thing we call butt wing. So if you're squatting and I get to the, the limitation of what my glute can do, what my hip can do for, for flexion, I'm gonna round my back when I squat. And that's something that we call butt wing. This stretch, the pigeon pose, is actually really good at opening up the hip so we can get a little bit deeper in our squat and prevent all that stress from going through our low back as we're squatting. So we're gonna put one foot in front of us. We're trying to have like a We'll say a perpendicular shin to our torso, but everybody's a little bit different. Now I want you to keep your chest up. So we're getting all of the stretch in your buttock. If you come down here and you round your spine while you're doing it, one, you're teaching your spine to just round more, but two, you're gonna get the movement in your back and not actually in your hips. So if you come up with your chest up and you lean into that, that hip, you're gonna feel a greater stretch. And now that you're here, you're stuck here for one minute. We're just hanging out, just stretching out that hip. We're getting ready to go into our first squat after these. We're going to be doing a version of a squat called a prying squat with thoracic rotation. Now, I taught my brother how to do prying squats, I think, two weeks ago uh, when he was uh, having a little bit of dad's gas. And so this will be a little less distracted. I'll take you through it show you how we can pry open your hips with the squat, but then also open that thoracic spine. Once again, the two centers of rotation of our body. Now I'm gonna switch my legs. So I've got that shin out in front of me, tall through the chest, stretching out the back of the hip. Remember, we don't wanna lean forward. You wanna be nice and tall through your chest. And if it hurts your wrist, once again, just bring over a bunch of pillows, bring over a chair to rest your arms on while you're doing this. So you can really, really, really get into that glute complex, the glute medius, the maximus, the minimus even, which we have there. We have a posterior capsule, we have our piriformis, and five or six other hip rotators back there. It's not just your piriformis back there. And all of these things can restrict the depth of your squat, or if you go to squat and you get down there anyway, you'll really round your spine, putting a lot of stress on the discs, on the central tendon, um, maybe on the facets it's less likely, but those first two things can really get stressed out and actually can end up causing pain. Okay, so it's time. We're going through the prying squat. We're gonna make five total squats and that's it. Just five squats. However, we're gonna add a couple things to it. So typically when I squat, I have people find a squat width that's about hip width. But I want you to go a little wider, maybe shoulder width. And a lot of the guys out there are like, yeah, I got these wide shoulders. Let's be realistic here. Have them be about shoulder width apart, okay? Maybe the width of your body. And a prying squat is done by getting down, getting your elbows between your thighs. And if you round your back with this, by the way, it's okay. It's not a loaded squat and we're not doing a lot of reps. 
but I do want your feet flat on the floor. You have your elbows between your knees and I'm prying them open. You see how my knees all of a sudden come apart a little bit more. I actually feel like I need to widen my feet a little bit and that's cool. So prying my knees apart, this is the first part of this one. I'm gonna put my hand down on the ground to kind of keep my knee there. And then I'm reaching up towards the ceiling, rotating my thoracic spine. Then I put that hand down. And then I rotate up towards the ceiling, come back down, and then I come up. I reset my squat. I get my arm down to pry open my knee. I rotate, hand comes down, rotate the other direction. And we redo it. We've got three more to go. So this is a prying squat with thoracic rotation. This is great if you're going to be doing some overhead squats. If you just need some overall thoracic mobility or even adductor stretching. I think we've got two more left. Back is tall. Up. Up. This is a great way to open up. Basically your entire body, especially even at the top, you're getting into hip extension at the top of your squat. So we're not just working flexion. And then rotation. We've got one more to go. They're nice and tall. Squat down low, pry open those knees. Open up your spine, look at your hand. And if that doesn't open up your thoracic spine and your hips, I really don't know what else will. I got nothing that can beat this. So um, that was our five. And now we're going to start kind of slowly transitioning more into our stability exercises, more into the stuff for our trunk and our hips that can help control our knees, maybe alleviate back pain because we'll get stronger and more controlled with picking things up or doing squats or deadlifts, things like that. So the first thing we're going to be doing is one of Dr. Stuart McGill's favorite exercises. This is a bird dog. If you don't know who Dr. Stuart McGill is, you should look him up. He's probably the world's foremost biomechanist when it comes to the low back and low back pain. He's done hundreds if not thousands of studies on the low back. He's a brilliant, brilliant guy up there in Canada. But we're going to be doing some bird dogs. We're doing 10 on each side. Once again, you got sensitive wrists. You can do this on your forearms, everybody else. Hands and knees, where we're going. And you're gonna reach one leg back, and it's back, okay? We're not reaching up. This is probably gonna cause more compression in your low back and ultimately more pain, okay? So we're reaching back with one leg and then straight forward with the opposite arm, okay? And then we're gonna switch. There we go. And we have 10 on each side, so I've done one. I'm just gonna kind of power through these. I'm staying really tight in my trunk. I'm also using my glute, I'm squeezing my glute for the up leg. I'm strong through my shoulders. And I'm taking my time. I'm not just rushing through these. We should take these just as seriously as we take a deadlift or a squat or a heavy overhead press. We're putting lots of effort into these to create stability in the entire system. I think I'm at six or so. Straight back leg, straight arm. You can stretch out your lats. You might notice that you have trouble reaching your arm and getting it up here if you have tight lats. So that child's pose stretch at the beginning might help you out. I think I got 10 right here. Nice and long. Okay. Now we're just gonna flip right onto our backs. This is some unilateral dead bugs. So a dead bug, we're moving around, our arms are moving, our legs are moving, but we're on our back like a dying bug. But a unilateral or ipsilateral dying bug is where one arm moves and the same side leg moves. And if you followed me in the past, you know that if we're doing these, chances are we're following them up with a hip flexor stretch. Because these are awesome at telling your hip flexors when to fire and when to relax. And we know that we can use that mechanism that lays within our body to then stretch a little bit more effectively after. And there's tons of ways to skin this cat as far as getting your hip flexors to turn on and off. 
But whatever way you choose, it's a great opportunity to then stretch your hip flexors after because we sit on our butts all day now. This predates quarantine and the virus. The average American sits, I think, between, I think it's 10 and 14 hours a day. And I actually think that is an underestimation. And basically, we're keeping our hip flexors short all day. And then we say, oh, I got an hour of activity and that's going to offset it. But it's, it's not going to do it. It's not going to cut it. And so if we can stretch more effectively, we don't need to stand all day, although I would you know, say that it could be beneficial. We don't need to walk for hours. You, know, you don't need one of those treadmill desks and you don't need to be stretching all day. If you stretch intermittently throughout your day, but in a very effective way, you can have lots and lots of health benefits for your hips, for your back, for your knees and all that stuff. So we're gonna do these ipsilateral dying bugs. We're on our backs. We got one arm up, sorry, both arms up. We got both legs up at 90 90 at our hips and our knees. As my right leg goes out, my right arm goes out. And then I'm back to the middle here. And I'm gonna go for 10, and then I'm gonna go 10 to the other side. And I'm just bracing my trunk. I'm not flattening my back because I don't wanna create more flexion in my spine, I wanna create rigidity or stiffness in my trunk, not just flexing my back. Because there's some of us who have flexion intolerant spines that if we try to do that, might give us radiating pain down our legs or even into our back or our buttock. I think I got three more. If you want, you can push your opposite hand and knee together to get a little bit more activity in your trunk. And now we're switching. I'm gonna do that for this side. We're just hanging out, starting to really wake our trunks up, getting away from those, uh, the appetizers that we were having earlier with the mobility and the flexibility. Although we're gonna be doing some stretching here in a second for our hip flexors, because we know that after we use our hip flexors, we really have a great opportunity to stretch them out. I think I got two more just stable in our trunk. We're not flattening, we're not pegging our backs down to the ground there. We're just trying to brace like you're getting ready to have a bowling ball dropped on your belly from five feet up. Brace. I've never once seen a boxer try to get ready for a punch by hollowing out his body or sucking in his belly button. They brace to get hit. They don't suck in and they don't flex their spine forward. Both of those positions are actually positions of weakness that allow someone to actually contact more of your organs, which you don't want if you're a fighter. Okay, it's hip flexor time. It is my favorite stretch. Closely coming up on its tail is a pec stretch, but for now, hip flexor stretch still takes the crown. We're gonna have our back toes down, because once again, back toe mobility, great toe mobility, I should say. We're gonna go forward with our spine a little bit, posterior pelvic tilt, and then come up nice and tall. We have a straight line between your knee and your shoulder. And you're just pushing that hip forward just a little bit. So if you're gonna go forward, your trunk has to go with it. You can't leave your head and shoulders behind because then you're gonna get, just compress your back a little bit more. And if you're saying, Mike, I'm not getting that much of a stretch here, although I bet you are, you can go ahead and reach back, try to get that heel to your butt. We've got about 30 seconds left here before we switch it all around. If you're grabbing that back foot, you can't be in this position. Okay, you can't be in that crescent position, crushing your low back. You have to be tall through your chest. And we got about 15 seconds left. I feel a big stretch in my quad. I just did a bunch of heavy squats before we started this. So they're barking at me. They said, I'm glad that today's a hip and knee and back day. Okay. So we're switching it up now, going to the other side. Just to keep tabs on time, we are a little over halfway. The stuff that we have uh, coming for you is more the meat and the potatoes, okay? It's the, the heavy lifting, we'll say. So we're gonna go forward, we're gonna post your pelvic tilt. We've got our big toes in back. And we're stretching out that hip flexor on the down knee. Now I'm a little bit more flexible on this side, then my right side. So I'm gonna pull this one up too. We're just hanging out and we're stretching. We're just stretching out the quads and the hip flexors because our quads attach to our pelvis 
So if they are tight or limiting, they can rotate your pelvis, they can anterior pelvic, pelvic tilt your, your pelvis, causing more compression in your spine. And your hip flexors go from your thigh bone, they go through your abdomen, all the way through the abdomen and attach to the lumbar spine directly. And so if you have tight hip flexors from sitting on your butt all day, and you go to stand or to produce extension in an exercise or running or walking or jumping, whatever it is, and you don't have the ability to express the length in your hip flexors, they're gonna pull on your spine. They're gonna pull in this direction and it's gonna cause you to do this. And instead of getting extension in your hip, you're gonna get it in your back and gradually over time, that's gonna piss things off. And that's not gonna be very good. I think we've got about a minute in there. All right. We're gonna to start to pattern a hip hinge, which is just part of the deadlift. And so a deadlift, we've got our knees bending a little bit, our hips doing a majority of the bending, and then we come up. But if we're just purely doing a hip hinge, our knees are gonna stay locked. And we're actually doing this to get a little bit of a hamstring stretch. So to do this, we're gonna have our feet about hip width apart, shoulder width apart, some comfortable stance, but you're gonna lock your knees up. From here, I'm gonna take my hands, I'm gonna put them right on the bones in the front of my hip. These bony prominences are called your ASIS. That's all you need to know. But if you push on them, and you push your hips back, and you'll see that my hips start going behind my knees, behind my ankles, and my back is straight, all of a sudden, I get a huge hamstring stretch here. Now from here, I'm gonna reach forward with my arms, stretching out my lats, and I might feel even more stretch in the front, because now I have some weight forward, which means I can lean my hip back a tiny bit more and I get more stretch. And then I come back and I go here and then forward. We've got six more. We're just making eight of these guys. Two, sorry, three, <laughs> four, five. Keeping your back straight and your knees straight. Okay, the, the movement is occurring at your hips. You've got three more to go. One, and everybody's is gonna look different depending on how tight your hamstrings are. Even yours might look different day to day depending on what you've done the day before. But if I deadlift, this is gonna look a lot differently the next day. And, oh, I lost my balance. I pushed my hips a little bit too far back. I can't end on that one. All righty, there we go. So, we're starting to incorporate a hip hinge, which is a great way to pick things up. Push your butt back, you have a nice straight back, and you can pick things up with those strong muscles. The strongest muscles in your body are your glutes. They're great at helping us pick things up, sparing our back, because that's what today is about. Back health, hip health, knee health, right? Okay. Now I'm looking down the list of exercises, we got four things left. This one comes with a slight disclaimer. This exercise might turn some people on. If anybody's in the room, you have to stare at them in the eyes while you're doing it. And this exercise is called the Frog Bridge. Okay, this one, uh, let's see, who introduced it? I learned about this one through Brett Contreras, also known as the Glute Guy. Okay, his sole focus pretty much seems to be the glutes. Okay, so if you're looking to develop your glutes, uh, if you're looking for rehab for your glutes, if you're looking to take some of the stress off your back, check out his stuff, the Glute Guy, uh, Brett Contreras down in, uh, I want to say San Diego. But he has people do this exercise all the time. It's called the frog bridge. And to do it, you're gonna be on your back. You're gonna be making 15 reps. You're gonna put the soles of your feet together. And then you're gonna lay, be laying on your back. And like I said, if you're alone, you have to go outside and you have to find somebody so you can stare at them in the eyes when you do it. If you have a loved one or family member close by, try it with them, see what they say. But you're gonna be down here, so you got your knees bent, soles of the feet together. I'm stretching out my adductors, my inner thigh muscles. Now I'm gonna keep my head up, but I want you to actually keep your head down if you can. You don't really have to stare at anybody in the eyes. It's a little weird. But you're gonna push your hips up, and you'll feel the outsides of your hips working, and those are pretty much your glute medius and your glute max saying, hey, let's get some hip extension. Or maybe you're really limited because of the musculature in the front of your hip your adductors and your hip flexors are really tight. And this can help loosen them up actively. But we're gonna make 15. So I've got 15, I already did one, but it doesn't count because I've taken so long of a break. We're just going up, feeling your glutes, 
and down. Up and down. I'm gonna turn a little bit and see me at a different angle. Three, and I'm on the outsides of my feet. Four, five, six, seven. Might as well get comfortable while I'm down here. Eight, nine, ten, eleven. Stretching out my adductors, feeling my glutes working, working on that frontal plane mobility that I talked about on Friday with our hip stuff. The side to side movement that we make comes from our glutes, comes from our adductors, and that's what this exercise is really, really good at. It's great at getting an active stretch so we can get more into these positions, these lunged positions to the side while keeping our foot down, while preventing us from rolling our ankles and things like that because then we're going to develop some great glute control, okay? So now comes the second variation of a plank of the day. The second thing we did today was a plank for our ankles. This is a plank for our hips. It's actually called a split stance side plank. What the heck is that? Well, split stance is when you have one foot forward and one foot back. It looks like this from the side. So basically, we're gonna be doing a side plank in this position because it's gonna be getting our abductors, it's glutes on, big glutes on the side of our body, and our adductors. But it's gonna be getting them, one, when they're in flexion, and then we're gonna switch it around on the same side, and then extension and flexion. So we're gonna be working those muscles in different ranges of motion because they do work differently depending on what you're doing with your hips. So we're gonna be down on our side, you're gonna get into that split stance. So typically a side plank, we're up here, but I want you to have your bottom leg forward and your top leg back. We're gonna hold a 15 second plank, then you're gonna switch your legs around and hold another 15 second plank, and then we're gonna to go to the other side. So you're down on your forearm, you have your elbow underneath your shoulder, you're pushing yourself away from the floor first, because a plank like this is just gonna make you see me on Fridays for, or uh, normally Wednesdays for neck and shoulder days. This week it's Friday for neck and shoulder. Or you're gonna have to walk into my clinic because your neck hurts and you're gonna say, hey, it was those side planks you gave me, you gotta fix this. We've got our legs straight, we have them split stance, pushing away from the ground and lifting our hips. So we have a straight line through our face, down our nose, down our sternum, and through our hips. And we're holding 15 seconds, we've got 10 seconds left. And then we're gonna switch our legs around, do the same thing. So you might pay attention. How do your adductors or inner thighs feel? How does the outside of your hip feel? And then we switch, and then you go up. And now what's working more? Do you feel it more in your trunk this way than the last way? Do you feel it more in your adductors or your abductors this way? Everybody's different. You're gonna report something back that's different than mine. Just know how you feel. Always pushing away from the ground. Great. Now we're switching sides. Doesn't matter how you do them, you're gonna go both ways. So you have your split stance, pushing away from the floor. Check the clock, here we go. Feel the adductors on my right leg going crazy in this extended position. My abductors feel pretty good. I do know that my right leg is a little weaker than my left. We've got four, three, two, one. Switch those legs around. Then we're gonna finish up after this because we've been using our abductors and our adductors and our glutes, trunk stability, all that stuff. We're gonna bring it all together with the king of the lifts, the single leg deadlift. It's only the king over a regular deadlift because it incorporates balance and rotational stability. And we are good. All right. If you have some water, grab it. That's a cue for me, just buying myself some time. Okay, so we have our last movement of the day. If you have some dumbbells or a kettlebell or maybe a medicine ball hanging out close, grab it if you want to load up your single leg deadlift. I have a gym full of de uh, kettlebells here, but I want to work on my movement quality today, working on my balance a little bit, so I'm not gonna be using any weight, but please, if you do, and we're doing, you know, if your left leg is your, your stance leg or your work leg, hold that weight in the opposite hand. That's gonna make it a little bit more challenging because it's gonna wanna pull you into rotation and you have to prevent that 
with your obliques, with your lats, and with your glutes on the opposite side of your body. So we're going to be going for eight single leg deadlifts. And now when you do this, I'm going to have my left leg be the work leg first. You're tall through your hips. I have my, my moving leg, okay, my open chain leg in back. It's going to be an extension of my spine. So as I go down, that leg just stays in line with my, my back. I'm not touching the ground. I don't care if you touch the ground here. I care that you have a straight spine. And then you come up. And then you go, whoops, see this is why I want to work on my balance. I want to not cut it. Here we go. Through the glute to come up. We're going eight on each side, if I didn't already say it. Take your time with them. If you load these up, grip real hard, keep that shoulder back. Don't reach down to the ground. Remember, the goal is not to touch the ground. The goal is to do them as good as you can. If that includes touching the ground, great. If not, great. Everybody's a little bit different. Maybe your limb lengths are different. Maybe you're using this little dumbbell that you'll just never get down to the ground. Maybe you're using a huge kettlebell that hangs a little bit lower. Who knows? We've got one more to go. Turn around for this one. Final side of the final exercise. Now this is my right leg. My right leg has slightly worse balance than my left from a couple sprains and fractures when I was a teenager. That's how I got into physical therapy. I think the most I've ever done this with was 135 pounds on a barbell. I only did probably one rep of it. It was probably pretty ugly. All right.